Where are they going? Are they there? Are they there? Down there. Down there. Now I'm like, oh, now I'm there. Okay, that's good. Just some, something to add to what Marco was saying. I heard that actually, if you read your, the Bible, if you read the King James Version, it's all got these these and thous. And that was actually the, the personal you <laughs> to God. So I don't know who said that to me, but, or where I read it, but it's sort of an interesting, interesting thing. But uh, okay, so... Marco said we're going to hear about God. Well, yes, we are. <laughs> but we might not hear about him in the book that we're studying uh, because he does not, he doesn't, we're still going on in Esther. I think last one, two weeks ago I said we might be at the end, but we're not there quite. There's at least one more sermon and there might be a few more uh, on Esther uh, that, are, that are in, in the book. And so, so we're going to jump ahead a bit in the book of Esther. So two weeks ago we looked at the... Uh, the episode where Esther realizes that God had put her in the palace for a purpose. That was in chapter 4. Then in chapter 5 and 8, Esther is able to convince the king to issue a second decree or edict to allow the Jews to defend themselves. Then Haman is, or Haman is killed on the gallows, on the gallows that he himself erected. And then Mordecai is given the honor that he deserved for saving the king. And now we come to chapter 9. And that's the day that the, the decree that the king issued is carried out. So let's read in Esther, Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nations were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators, administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and became, he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Talfon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridanatha, Aridatha, something like that, <laughs> Parmashta, Arasai, Aridai and Vaisatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay hands on the plunder. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the, same, to the king that same day. The king said to Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the ten sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. All very nice stuff. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men. 
but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th day they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. God works in the same way today as he did in the book of Esther. We too live in an age when miraculous displays of God's might are not usual, are not the usual way he does things. Yet we are still expected to believe in his power and presence. I read a story recently about a father and a son on their way back from church one Sunday that encouraged that father's faith in God's power and presence in his life. On that Sunday morning, our Gordon was driving home from church. His five-year-old son, Nigel, asked him to speed up so that they would not be late for the start of Superman on television. Gordon reminded Nigel that the television had not been working because of a problem with the satellite receiver. The repairman had been called, but since it was Sunday, he wasn't expected until someday the next, sometime the next day. And even if he did show up, the house was locked while they had been at church. After a few minutes of sullen silence, Nigel suggested that they pray that God would fix their TV in time for Superman. Gordon was about to remind Nigel that we shouldn't pray for things like that because God is not at our beck and call. But then he remembered the text that the preacher taught from that Sunday. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The preacher had encouraged the congregation to pray about any matter that was on their heart, large or small. For if it troubled them, their heavenly Father cared about it. Gordon wanted his son to know that he could turn to God with any troubling matter. And a glance in the rearview mirror at Nigel's pouting face clearly showed that missing Superman was troubling his son. Gordon pulled the car over and listened as Nigel prayed, asking God to fix their TV in time for Superman. More concerned about his son's developing a relationship with God than about the TV, Gordon asked the Lord to please hear Nigel's prayer. As soon as they pulled into the driveway, Nigel jumped out of the car and ran towards the front door as Gordon put the car in the garage. Gordon knew they had locked the front door before leaving for church, and so he was surprised to find the door standing open behind Nigel. Gordon was astounded when he entered the house and found Nigel sitting in front of the TV watching Superman. Just then, a good family friend came down from upstairs the friend was unexpectedly passing through town and he knew where the outside key was hidden. So he had let himself in. And just a few minutes after he had arrived, the TV repairman turned up and quickly fixed the problem. Now more than 10 years have passed and Nigel hardly remembers the incident, but Gordon vividly remembers it as an example of the extraordinary and complete unpredictable ways in which God works. Are we certain that it was God at work? Certainly there was nothing miraculous about the repair of the TV. A more skeptical person might view this incident merely as an interesting 
coming together of improbable events. Reviewing the unusual sequence of events in hindsight, it's probable that the, the TV was already working. Even at the moment, Nigel offered up his prayer. So it would have been repaired even if he had not prayed. Or would it? The relationship between petitioning prayer and divine providence is a deep mystery. Do our prayers move God to change the sequence of events? Does God anticipate our prayers and, prevent, and providentially arrange events to answer them before we even ask? As Nate's petition about the TV would suggest, just like in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, where it says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. If so, does God's foreknowledge of when we don't pray have a similar effect? Was God at work in this extraordinary sequence of ordinary events or not? And if so, to what end? I think because God's ways are so beyond our understanding, we're going to have always, well, often have difficulty understanding God's role in such events in life and in history. The author of Esther was reflecting on this same kind of difficulty and inviting his readers, inviting us to reflect on the same thing when he carefully crafted the report of the Jews' deliverance without even mentioning God's role in the events. The book of Esther invites us to think about the nature of faith in a world where God is unseen. Only people who entertain the possibility of God's interaction with human lives can see God moving in the events that the author of Esther describes. The atheistic rationalists will not even entertain the possibility of an unseen reality intervening. Last week, Chris talked about hope. In the passage in Romans that Chris used, it asks the question about hope. Who hopes? for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In Hebrews 11 verse one, we're using the concept again of hope to define faith as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In other words, the very definition of faith calls us to a certainty in the unseen reality lying behind or beyond the events we do not see. Even when, and perhaps especially when, the events are so incompatible with what we would expect given God's power and presence. Therefore, if our hope, if our faith, if our certainty does not rest with what we see, the visible events of history and life, what does it rest on? It can only rest on God's word. The explanation God gives, he gives us in the word, the explanation of the unseen reality behind the visible events. Only through trusting in God's word can we move from uncertainty about events, about the events that take place in our lives, to certainty that God is working in those events. This means we can only understand the workings of God in the book of Esther by reading the whole story in the light of the wider context 
of God's word to us, the Bible. However, if we read through Esther too quickly, we might miss the opportunity to reflect on the relationship between events and faith. One example of this is in our reading from Esther chapter 9. If we were to read through this chapter quickly, we might miss the significance of the author telling us that the Jews did not take any plunder from their enemies. In chapter 8 and verse 11, it describes the edict that Xerxes issued to allow the Jews to protect themselves. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. So even though this edict from Xerxes permitted the Jews to plunder the property of their enemies, the author says three times that they did not lay a hand on the plunder. That tells me that although the edict was issued in the name of a pagan king, the Jews recognized that it was God at work and that the victor's spoils did not belong to them, but to God. Through their knowledge of God's word, the Jews understood that the execution of this decree was governed by the ancient command of holy war, like the one against the Amalekites. One of the rules of ancient holy war was that plunder must not be taken. When Abraham, for example, fought for Sodom because his nephew Lot had been taken captive, the king of Sodom offered him material reward. Abraham, however, would not, would accept nothing in case that wicked city became a source of his prosperity. This example set a precedent for God's people. When the Lord commanded the conquest of the promised land, Joshua and the Israelites devoted whole cities to the Lord. This meant killing every living thing in it, men, women, children, cattle, sheep, donkeys, Rodriguez, <laughs> and burning the buildings to the ground, that any gold, silver, or precious articles found in that city were to be put in the treasury of the Lord's house. The Hebrew word for such dis complete destruction was harem, which means something devoted exclusively to God. There was to be no profit from pers or personal profit from holy war because the destroyers were acting not on their own behalf but as agents of God's wrath. But if you read through the story of the Israelites, you'll know that the Israelites took illicit plunder more than once. They trusted in the strength of their own army instead of waiting on the Lord. And they generally lived no better than the wicked people that they were to war against in God's holy name. Israel's first king, Saul, violated the trust of holy war when he failed to destroy completely the Amalekites, including King Agag, the ancestor or ancestor of Haman. Saul did not kill every living thing and he plundered the best of their possessions. The confusion of his motives is revealed when he is confronted by the prophet Samuel. The Lord sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Now, caught in disobedience, Saul tries to rationalize his actions. 
explaining that he was going to sacrifice all the plunder to the Lord later anyway. He tried to justify himself by claiming that his obedience would come later. And this is the context for Samuel's famous words, to obey is better than sacrifice. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he rejected you. He has rejected you as king. Because King Saul failed to execute holy war properly in obedience to the Lord's command, he was disqualified as Israel's king and God's agent on earth. In Esther, the Jews of Persia succeeded where Saul had failed. They were not only obedient to God's rules of engagement in a holy war, they finished the job God had given Saul to do by ending the line of King Agag as they killed Haman and his sons. Events as historic as the deliverance of the Jews in Persia, as well as those as private as a child's answered prayer, are an encouragement for us to view all of life and history with the certainty of the unseen reality of God's presence and power. Such events reveal that God can and will do just as he has promised, even when we don't see how he possibly could. The awareness of God's power and presence should excite us to prayer that is full of anticipation. The answer to our prayers are already on their way, set in motion through a chain of previous events that might appear insignificant, even if we somehow became aware of them. Our modern faith in God's promises rests on the texts of the Bible that are growing more ancient with each passing generation. We live at a time where there are no prophets of Yahweh bringing his, us his word. All we have and all we need to know about of God is found in his written word and the promises it contains. The Bible contains selected events from times long ago and an explanation of the unseen reality that makes these events significant throughout all subsequent human history. Most centrally, it speaks of the crucifixion of Jesus, Israel's perfect warrior, who with clean hands and a pure heart, finally waged the ultimate holy war on the cross, conquering sin and death. But those words are 2,000 years old. And many today see their relevance or fail to see their relevance in the troubling issues of modern life. The Bible assures us that in the full expanse of human history, including the days in which we now live, that they're all covered by God's, in God's redemptive, pl redemptive plan. At the moment he left, Jesus promised to be with us always, even to the end of history. God is still working in this world, calling people into his kingdom and bringing all of history to its appointed end. One day, God's redemptive work will be finished when Israel's divine warrior and king returns and the world bows in submission to him. There is good reason to believe he is able to do just as he has said, even though he said it so long ago. But scripture warns us of being skeptical about God's ability to fulfill his ancient promises. In 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 3 to 7, it says, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. 
Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world at the time of the deluge was, and was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The all-powerful word of God that created the universe justifies our certainty in the continuity of God's providential work in and through human lives to move his people from death to life as he moves history towards its end on the day of judgment. Our generation is no less a living link in God's work in history than were, the, than were Esther and Mordecai's. Christ has come, but the gospel must still go out to all nations in every generation until he returns. Even those whose sinful pride like Haman's turn them against God and the gospel are in the final analysis players in the universal plan of redemption. Perhaps in the end, they tragically will be what the Apostle Paul refers to as objects of wrath. Who, like Haman, form dark links in a plan of salvation that nevertheless cannot be stopped. We can only hope that before their end, they will turn to Christ and become objects of his mercy that they will be among the people whom God has called out from both the Jews and the Gentiles to be saved from destruction. For all who have come to know Christ have been saved from God's wrath. As God brings his ancient promise of salvation to fulfillment in individual lives throughout history. We cannot at any one moment know the significance of world events or even that of the ordinary events in our own private lives. The author of Esther calls us to trust in the power and presence of God, even when he seems absent and we can't imagine how he could possibly do what he has promised in his word. Reflection on the events described in Esther should make us more open to the creative and unexpected ways God works in us and through us. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. However, that faith is a certainty in the unseen realities lying behind what we do see. We are to live with the knowledge that both our best moments and our worst are all part of what God is doing in us and through us and through us in the lives of others. We cannot see the results of events from where we are, but the story of Esther assures us that we don't have to because God does. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the confidence that we can have in you, that your promises that you made in your word are true. And that you will keep those promises. Lord, we, we thank you for your working, the working of your spirit in our lives. 
Lord, help us to, to see more of, the, of you working in our everyday lives. Lord, we know you are, but often, Lord, we just don't notice it. Lord, help us to see that. that in everyday events, you are working. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you that you sent your son to bring us salvation. Lord, we pray for those who don't know you. Lord, we pray that you would move them Move us towards them. That we can bring your good news to them. That they will recognize in what we do and in what we say that there is a different way. There is a better way. And that way is through Jesus. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you in his name, Jesus, our Savior. Amen.